Thank you for that nice introduction, and thank you all for coming out tonight. I know it's always hard to leave the family and get out to such things, and I hope I can make you feel like it was a worthwhile experience. Um, you may wonder, what's another Lillard doing in this Montessori business? <laughs> and, and I'll tell you, I was kind of skeptical about Montessori around when I finished college and um, when I did the assistance to infancy training with Lynn when Margaret was a little two-year-old. Um, I felt like you know the best educational system would probably combine elements of this old Montessori system with other new things that we know. And it's just over the years, I am more and more convinced the more that I study it. And I also have to say, I've been in Montessori schools all over the world, and this is one of the best that I've seen anywhere in terms of the engagement that I see in the children and the happiness and the joy as they're, as they're doing their work. So, you know, I, I, you all are fortunate to have, have such a school in your community, and I really admire the, the community for putting it together, the teachers and, and um, all that do that. So my plan tonight is to I'd first tell you a little bit about the study that I'm, that I'm doing here and why I'm doing it here, um, just because this is an opportunity and I think you'll think it's kind of neat stuff. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about this study that's just come out in Frontiers in Psychology. I'll talk a little bit about other research with older children, because this focused on primary, and then um, we'll draw some conclusions. So um, the research questions that I'm trying to address in the study that I'm doing here are whether behavioral changes are associated with an epigenetic change, specifically demethylation of the oxytocin receptor gene, and whether this lines up with behavior and with teacher observations, and then whether that's particular to a Montessori environment. So why in Montessori? Well, Montessori saw that if you prepared the environment with useful activities that involved the hand working in service of the mind, are self-correcting, are challenging, um, are graduated in difficulty, and are interconnected, and so on. And you set the children free in this environment where the teacher connects them one by one to the materials, only intervening in unconstructive behaviors, that children start to concentrate in a really deep way that she used to think children couldn't concentrate either. And you know, we tend, we tend to think that. But the, she saw these profound changes as they started to concentrate, which she referred to as normalization. And it was, it was changes where they become more empathetic, they become um, kinder, they make better decisions, they become precociously intelligent, all kinds of interesting changes. So just sit back for a sec. So, so development is the environment acting on genetic information that changes the way that that genetic information gets expressed. And this was something that, interestingly, Montessori saw long, long ago. For many years in developmental psychology, we've talked about, is it nature or nurture? You know, is it your genes or is it your environment? She saw early on how interconnected these are. Biologists have respected this for, for quite a while, and developmental psychology, just in the last 20 years, has started to really appreciate this. Well, Montessori said, you know, there's the physical program that we have, the sort of genetically um, set up physical program of development, and then there's the mental program of development. And she said, development proceeds well when the physical and the mental can work together in, in concert. So normal development happens when the physical and the mental are growing together in a good environment. And she said deviations come about when somehow that gets disrupted. So for example, um, for a child who's in a, who's in a crib and has some will to act but can't because they're prevented from moving, that would lead to a deviation. Or when adults are um, governing children's behavior so much, telling them what to do, then the child's not free to have their mind and their body work together. And so when the adult then becomes a substitute for the child's will, you start running into problems. And I think it's a really, really interesting idea when we think about, for example, uh, meditation or yoga are real cases of, of the body and the mind working together. 
you know, our minds have a tendency to kind of run off, and you know, so there are ways to kind of pull it back and bring it back to the body. And the practical life activities in Manasari are a prime example of that, and so are the sensorial activities of getting the body and the mind aligned with, with each other. So physical deviations, Manasari noted, you know, warts, hair lips, club feet, mental deviations, she said things like lying, disobedience, possessiveness, um, instability of attention, gluttony, and even excessive fantasy were things that she thought came about because the physical and the mental weren't able to move together. So she said, each time that such a polarization of attention took place, the child began to be completely transformed, to become calmer, more intelligent, and more expansive. Normalization, she said, is like a, a psychological cure, a return to normal conditions when the body and the mind can work together. She said that a child who's become normalized, who's started to concentrate, shows obedience that's given with joy, kind of like the internalization of norms in the good sense, kind of the, the good norms of our culture, that we smile, we say hello, we get along, we you know, clean up after ourselves, and so on. Um, Schaefer Zemer pointed out that the term came from anthropology, where it means being a contributing member of society. And elsewhere, Manasari said that a child who's normalized is precociously intelligent, one who's learned to overcome himself and live in peace, and who prefers a disciplined task to futile idleness. Okay, so there's this interesting concept of normalization. All right, and then we can think, you know, to be very simplistic about it, of two kinds of minds. You might have a mind that's reactive, that's always fight or flight ready, that sort of does things superficially because it's got to be ready for the next thing, and that's self-protective. Or you might have a mind that's very calm, very concentrated, does deep learning, is compassionate. And there are different kinds of environments that those kinds of minds might be adapted to be in. So there's a dangerous environment, you know, you never know where the next lion's coming from or, you know, gunfight or whatnot. You need that first kind of mind. But if you're in a safe environment, a beautiful environment, then you can deeply concentrate and learn. And so it, it seems that our minds and our ways of being are adapted for the environments that we need to be in. And part of this um, has been shown in a really interesting way recently by work on epigenetics. So epigenetics means um, the elements that are on top of the gene that are going to um, influence how it gets expressed. And this is a fairly new research area in biology, and it's been ushered in in important ways by a man named Michael Meany, who's at McGill, and uh, many of us think he's going to be a Nobel Prize winner before long, so remember that name. So in some of Michael Meany's research, what got him down on this epigenetic track was th they're studying stress responses in, in rodents, and they noticed that rats that they handled a lot when they were young have a much calmer stress response when they get older, a much healthier stress response. So, so an unhealthy stress response, and what you see a lot in, say, um, people who are living in really difficult, those dangerous environments, is cortisol is up high and it stays high all day long. But people who've been raised in a safer environment, their cortisol will shoot up when something dangerous happens, but their body's able to downregulate it quickly so that everything's, everything's fine. So, so these mice that had been, and rats as well that had been handled when they were young have that healthier kind of response. And so they're wondering, you know, what, what could this be? Well, if you think about it, when you handle a little animal and you, that's a baby and you put it back in the cage, what does the mother tend to do? Often goes up and licks them all over the place, right? So they started thinking, gosh, is there something that's going on when after we'd handled those babies and we put them back in and the mothers engage in this behavior that leads to this better stress response later? And a, a good mother rat does lick and groom her pups and, and also um, does this kind of hunching over to give them extra space so they can get um, to suckle her, her undersides. And if she's been more like that when they're young, they have this healthier stress response. 
not so good mothers don't do that and they don't get the healthy stress response. You may just wonder, where am I going <laughs> towards this research? But I promise we're going to get there. So the first study, they, they stroked the babies with a paintbrush. Instead of taking them out and handling them and putting them back in, they just tried, you know, what if we stroke them with a, um, a paintbrush and, and not put them with their mothers at all? And lo and behold, they were less stressed as adults. But still, they wanted to look at this in a really um, complete way. So they swapped the babies in utero so that a stress mom who doesn't lick and groom a lot now had the babies of a mom who licks and grooms a lot. And, and the babies of the, you know, they sw swapped in both ways. And lo and behold, the babies grew up to be like their nurturer as opposed to like their genes, OK? So the, these, these behaviors, and it's particularly in a period from, say, like five to eight days after birth. There's a critical period during which this stroking needs to happen. Well, um, Meany went on to discover the cause of this, the underlying cause, through a series of elegant biological experiments. And what they found was that um, on the gene that is um, governing the corticosteroid receptors, there is, um, so, so you remember how the DNA turns into RNA and replicates itself? Well, when you get a methyl group, this chemical, on a part of the gene, it will stop the replication of that particular part of the gene. And so what they found was when there are low levels of licking and grooming, you get more methyl groups on the corticosteroid uh, genes, causing there to be fewer of these receptors. And that then leads to the, the poor stress response. OK, so fast forward then. So this was a really fascinating thing, to see that something that happens in the environment when you're young can change how you are far later by, by changing the way that the hormones get taken into your body. So we are looking at the oxytocin receptor gene, and these are all part of um, the HPA axis where your hypothalamus is um, governing stress responses and much else. So the oxytocin receptor gene is implicated in anxiety, depression, ADHD, concentration, learning memory, social behavior, autism, empathy, compassion, social connection, many, many things. And I have a colleague, um, Jess Connolly, who studied um, starting out uh, prairie voles because they pair bond for life, so they've looked at the oxytocin receptor, but she's also shown that it's implicated in psychopathology, social skills, social perception, empathy, and, and the like. Okay, so now I hope it's starting to come together for you. I started to wonder, is normalization the result of demethylation of the oxytocin receptor gene? And it makes sense, given all the array of behaviors that Montessori thinks goes along with children starting to deeply concentrate. So is it the case that children feel safe? They're in an environment where they can deeply concentrate. That causes demethylation of the oxytocin receptor gene and leads to this huge array where children are you know, nicer, more empathic, and, and so on. So that is why we're coming in and taking the children's saliva. And, and why am I doing it here? Well, I always want to start with what I know is a really good Montessori program. I feel like if you go to something that's not a good Montessori program and you don't see it, you don't know if the problem is that it's not happening in Montessori or just this wasn't a good implementation. So I wanted to do this first here because I feel like this school really gets children into this state. and so. Um, in May, we came in and we just did broad scale, and we did four to 14-year-olds because that's what I had permission to do at the time. The UVA, you know, they're very, very careful because a lot of this is, um, comes out of the hospital and medical research, and they have to be so careful with HIPAA laws and everything. So um, that's why the forms are so crazy. Um, but, but we had 70 children ages 4 to 14, and it was the case that children whose oxytocin receptor gene was... Um, more methylated were also considered to be less normalized in, in teacher observations. And you can see the line there. But we had a restricted range because so many of the children were already considered to be very, very well normalized. So now we're going for a younger sample who we think is less likely to be. So 17 months, I think we even had a, a 10-year-old, but generally we're trying to stop at eight or nine years. And we've got. Um, teacher observations, but I'm also doing behavioral measures, and we're looking at the change across the school year. 
and should we see what we're um, expecting to see there, then the next thing will be um, there's some schools in Washington, D.C. where I can have a comparison non-Montessori sample that lost a lottery to, to get in. And just to show you what the saliva kits look like this, and um, they had to spit in May, but now we just take some Q-tips and put them in, and they absorb some of the saliva, and then I cut them into this little dish. And then little behavioral tests like you drop things and, and see if the children quickly come to help um, pick them up or whether they just kind of look at you. Um, so, so those are the sorts of things that we're doing. And I, I thank you all so, so very much for um, letting us see if this has support. Because if it does, it's going to be just really astounding and astonishing that a school program could lead to a biological change. I mean, I think, I think it'll be a PNAS or a science paper if it happens.